Good afternoon. Um, we're going to go ahead and uh, get started today. I have a couple announcements. The first announcement is we have a new alumni director at McPherson College, Monica Rice. And uh, we're, we're very happy to have Monica. She's a Manchester uh, graduate and also a graduate of Bethany uh, Seminary. And she's, held, she's done a few projects, a lot of different positions and everything. And uh, <clears throat> it's one of those things when you interview someone and you do the first round of interviews, you just know that things are going to work out. And we've been very happy that they have. And we offered it to Monica. She didn't waste any time. She said yes. And she was anxious to start working. So yesterday was day one. Today is day two. We'll give her a long weekend. And then the work will really start uh, uh, happening. Uh, she has homecoming to look forward to here in about six weeks and, and a few other things. So um, we're happy to have her on board. Now we're going to have Dr. Ells uh, come and do her presentation on grandparents off the hook. I'm interested in hearing this one myself. So, uh, thank you. Good afternoon. <laughs> Let's just dance along. Okay. <sighs> Let me get out a marker or two. And I will try to remember to move the PowerPoints as we need to. I just I'm not a real PowerPoint person, but they sometimes keep me um, on track. I had an alternate title for today's presentation, and that was the importance of being a grandparent. Um, I want to start, though, by saying this applies as, can apply just as well to aunts and uncles. Uh, anyone who's truly been a critical force in the life of a child. But almost all of our research looks at grandparents. So I, I did leave it there. Um, there's substantial research that shows there is an, and I'm saying this for my mom, dad, and grandparents in heaven who spent a lot of money educating me. There's a lot of evidence that shows there's an intergenerational transmission of values between grandparents and grandchildren. Sounds impressive, doesn't it? Intergenerational transmission of values. Thanks, Dad. Okay. Basically, what that is looking at, and I'll get to formal definition in a moment, is that values tend to skip generations. Children, or grandchildren's value structures are more similar to their grandparents than their parents. And this has led to a great deal of research um, to try to figure out why. Part of it is, we like to say that parents are the source of unconditional love. Sounds really good. That we'll love you no matter what you do. But the reality is, parents are responsible to raise children to be socially responsible, well-behaving, good children, great adults. What that means is, parents are not always unconditional in the love. We all know we correct behavior. We tell children we're disappointed in them. We tell them to stop that this minute. And we all know the mommy death stare that can be felt for yards away, sometimes over the phone. That is not unconditional love. We have all had that feeling of, I am going to be in so much trouble, or I have disappointed my parents. That is not unconditional love. Grandparents, on the other hand, are off the hook. They can do this unconditional love stuff because they get to be with you for a while, and then they send the children home. Okay? They, all a grandparent most of the time has to do is love. Okay? Thus, we find that children are more likely to listen to what a grandparent has to say model that behavior, even when it's the same thing a parent might have said, than they are parents. 
Just by accident, I, had an, I have an example from this as I left Melhorn this afternoon to come over here. As I walk out the door, I see a student talking on his cell phone, and now he's got it so that everybody can listen. He's holding his phone like this, and I hear him say, Dad, you never listened to me. Pay attention, I told you. Go to Grandma's house. She knows where it's at in my room that I stay in at Grandma's house, and she has my address. She emails me every week. You just call me. I don't know why you can't just listen to what I'm saying. No, Dad, I'm not saying you're bad, you don't mail me stuff, but why should I give you my address when Grandma has it? But you don't listen. Grandma listens, you don't. Okay? So I don't know how long this conversation had been going on, but it's obviously he was frustrated because he just wanted him to pick up something at Grandma's and mail it to him. But Dad wants something else. And as I am just getting out of range, I hear, never mind, I'll call Grandma, she'll do it. Okay. Now, we might want to talk about interpersonal communication and whether he was respectful with his dad, but my whole point was, Grandma listens. You don't. Dad was task-oriented, and I suspect what he wanted was the socio-emotional response from Dad. Okay. So, why do you think it's so? Why do you think grandparents played such a role? I've given you some ideas. Why do you think grandparents are so important in the life of a child? What are some of the roles grandparents play? I got the marker, I got the paper. They're always happy to see you. Okay. Pardon? In my case, they're always guests. Pardon? They are always guests. Always guests? Lots of positive physical touch. Why else do kids love grandparents? What else do they do? They make cookies? Yeah. They tell a lot of stories. Okay. What kind of stories? Family stories, stories about the past. I forgot to ask, where can I safely put this? Hang this. Any others that you can think of? Probably won't say no. Won't say no? Probably won't say no. Well, this is kind of a different angle, but I think, I'm thinking back to my children, a lot of it is just the things that I heard my parents say about their parents. Can you, can you help me out just a little bit with well, an example? It portray, I mean, you knew the work that they did, you knew different things that they had done. Situations. You don't know how hard of a time I have not wanting to stop and tell you a story about my grandparents on every single one of these points. They and, give you gifts. Okay. They, give you gifts. they don't scold. Okay. Take you special places. Okay. Well, you guys are cooking tonight, today. I thought it's that hand. Okay. And so they were special trips. Yeah. They live in a distance. They're a treat.
And we'll find that this is one that's even more so today as people move further and further away. And we're going to talk about maybe some ways we can keep closer in contact. Any others? I'm going to add one. Grandparents aren't afraid to play. They'll read stories, they'll play in Play-Doh, they'll color, they'll go to the park. They're willing to do those things, to take the time. Something that children don't always get with parents. And grandparents aren't afraid to run around with a balloon where an adult otherwise might be. And so having somebody as a playmate can also be fun. So we're going to set this here because we're going to find that the research supports a great deal of this. So we're going to hang this one up too. And if you remember when we talked about marriage and another one, I took those back and took a, put them into my class when we talked about how to keep a marriage going. If you don't mind, I'd like to take these back for my class. So you see, I have an ulterior motive to keep coming back. You give me stuff for class. Okay. All right. And I think we just did this one. But I want to tell you a little bit about my grandparents, because I got the mic and I can. Okay. And if you want to share later, you can. But I have to tell you about Mamo Snavely. My sister could never say grandma, and so she named, nicknamed her Mamo. And Mamo Snavely was my mother's mother, and she was the greatest. In the summer, she would pack up her house and she would come and live with us, and she took care of my sister and I. She let us have cookies and Kool-Aid, even when we weren't supposed to. She regaled us of her childhood in Ireland. She taught us a little Gaelic. She taught us Irish jigs, which my mother had expressly forbidden. We got to do it anyway. And she tried to show me how to trick the afternoon Sandman. She taught me if I just lay very still and kept my eyes closed, she'd stay on the lookout for him. And if I pretended to be asleep, the Sandman wouldn't sprinkle sleepy dust on me, and I could get back up and play. Unfortunately, every afternoon, the Sandman hit her first. <laughs> and so when I woke up and it was a little bit cranky that the Sandman had caught in me, she apologized profusely, and that's when I got cookies and Kool-Aid, which made it all right. Okay. Um, she taught me, a, she taught both my sister and I a lot about manners. We had traditional tea parties with stuffed animals, and if one of us made a mistake, we forgot to say please or thank you. We hadn't made the mistake, it was the stuffed animal behind us, and she would carefully coach them on the next time, and she would put us in charge of watching them for the next time. She was wonderful. She was a very short, very round lady who was just full of love. And my mamma was the best mamma ever. Until Grandpa and Grandma Workman came around, and that was my dad's parents, and then they were the best Grandpa and Grandma ever. Okay? Um, and quite frankly, I couldn't have imagined life, my life, without them. I grew up at weekends at their house. They lived in a teeny tiny town where kids could run. And I often on weekends were with ten, 10 or more cousins. My grandparents had five sons and they believed in be fruitful and multiplying. So I had a lot of cousins. Um, we all had chores, but when chores were done, we were free to go. We might be grandpa in his work shed doing something. We might be with grandma in the garden or fishing. And we learned so many life lessons. That was where I really learned the principle of being busy, of doing hard work, that life is about being productive. I never saw either one of them sit idle. 
and that at the end of the day you talked about what you did. And they were so proud when I went to college because I was the first grandchild to go to college. I was the first grandchild to graduate from college. And my grandmother was really a penny pincher. I, I know that she, in fundraising, she would have gotten $10 out of every nickel. Okay? But when I went on to graduate school, I went to the bank to draw a little bit out of my savings account. And when they gave me my statement, I went, there must be a mistake. I don't have this much in savings. And I went, oh, your grandmother's been in here. <laughs> Pardon, said the giraffe. <laughs> what do you mean my grandmother's been in here? She said, well, she made a deposit in your account. And my grandmother had put more than $1,000 in my savings account. That was not like my grandmother. And I called to say, Grandma, I think you put money in the wrong account. And she said, no, I put it in the right account. I'm investing in you. I know my money will be well cared for. I was just simply flabbergasted, amazed, and humbled. But as a teenager and a young adult, she did something for all of us grandkids that I will never forget. And that is, if we really had come to loggerheads with our parents, we could always go to Grandma and Grandpa's house. And the north bedroom was ours. Now, that was the bedroom my dad had and shared with his youngest brother. But if you came out and you were fuming, Grandma would say, go to the north bedroom till you calm down, and then we'll talk. And should your parents arrive in the meantime, Grandmother would bar at, them at the door and say, we're not ready for you yet, go home. <laughs> and my grandpa would go, you would not have allowed such interference when you are a parent. And she goes, absolutely, but I'm not a parent. Now, I'm a grandparent. I can do what I want. These are my grandbabies. <laughs> and when we calmed down and we'd sit with a cup of tea, grandpa drank coffee, grandma drank, drank tea. She thought coffee was evil. We'd sit and we'd drink a cup of tea and talk about it, and Grandma would actually say what your parent had said, but she had a way of saying it to make it seem reasonable. And then we talk about solutions, one of which was how do you save face with your parents? And when we came up with a solution, she'd call your parents and say, if you're ready to be reasonable, you could come out to the house. And your parents would come out and grandma would meet them at the door and go, are you going to be reasonable? You're a workman, I know you don't know how, but are you? And if they were, we'd all sit at the table and grandma would sit there and mediate. And if voices raised, grandma sent us to the north bedroom and our parents home. So we learned not to raise voices, and we came to reasonable conclusions and solutions. I think every one of my cousins, including me, spent at least one night in the North Bedroom, some more than others. But what you felt was this enveloping sense of love and warmth around you, that no matter what you did, no matter how awful it might seem, Grandma and Grandpa had your back. And you always knew there was somebody who would always love you, that the, there was always a door you could knock on and go home. The reality is we could have had our parents, but there was, that would not have felt the same. That would have been running home with, and saying, I was wrong, you were right. And sometimes when you're 18 or 19 or 16, that's hard to do. And grandma made it easy to go back home. And it made it easy for parents to come in and say, I think your grandma's got a point here. Because it was their point all along. And so when I think of grandparents and that warmth, that's what I think of. That's my experience. I don't know what your experiences were, but when I think of them, I smile.
Now, as a family sociologist, I have always been interested in this notion of this intergenerational transmission of values because I can see what I got from my mamma, who was an Irish immigrant child whose parents died on the way over here, and who at 15 was responsible for two younger siblings, and who raised them, who became a nurse, who later had five children of her own, but who always had time for a story, who always had time for children on her lap, who was a gracious woman. My grandpa and grandma workmen never had a lot, but what they had they always shared. Um, on the side of one of their fences was a hobo cat. I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's a very crude sign that hobos draw um, today we call them voluntarily homeless, but in their age they were called hobos. And what it is, is it's a sign that means a kind-hearted woman resides within. And it didn't matter how little or much they had, that sign was always there because they said they always had enough for another. There was always room for one more. And I learned from them to have a giving heart. That sign resides above my office door. I learned life isn't about things. Life is about people. That you don't measure things in objects, you measure them in laughs. And that there is no situation so desperate you can't find humor in it. And I know I'm probably gonna go to hell someday for laughing at the wrong moment. So when we look at intergenerational transmission of values, what we're really looking at is a value orientation that tends to jump one generation. And our value systems most closely parallel our grandparents than my parents. I can tell you my parents would, my father would say, if they want a meal, they could get a job. I've worked hard for what I have, they can too. But I would see my grandma coming up with jobs for somebody who needed a meal so that they earned it, as opposed to a handout. We tend to think and believe more like they do, especially if we have spent considerable time with them. So, We've already looked at some of the roles grandparents play in the life of a child, some of the ways grandparents bond with them. For one thing, many grandparents are just happy to see grandchildren. And they want to, and they want to spend time with them. Grandparents welcome children into their arms. They want them on their lap. I laughed inside when you said make cookies because my grandma workman always found out the week before finals and would send me ginger snaps. Because I loved her ginger snaps and she, I would, she knew I would study a lot and so she always would send me ginger snaps in bite-sized pieces. Little tiny ginger snaps so I could just pop them in and a box of tea bags so that I wouldn't drink coffee. Okay. One of the other things they do is they are our touchstone to the past. They are the keeper of family history. Without them, we don't know our past. We learn much about who we are from them. And grandparents might say no, but chances are they'll come up with an alternative that sounds equally exciting. And we learn stories about them. I find it very interesting that some of you may have been children in the Depression. Do we have anybody who was raised in the Depression in here? 
How many of you have told your grandchildren about that time? Many don't, and when I talk about it in class, my students are amazed at what you went through. My grandparents didn't tell me, but my dad did. When I wondered why <clears throat> some things were the way they were, Grandparents are full of little gifts. They may not have been things that cost a lot, but they're full of gifts. One of those gifts is time. Okay. Another thing is taking children to special places. And we'll come back to that one. And if you don't get to see them very often, that makes them even more special. And they play. So what does some of the research show this? I'm a professor, I have to have research. Okay, Strom, Collingsworth, Strom, and Griswold found that grandparents are important in family cohesiveness. They convey family history, family stories, and family customs. One of the things I found is every family have customs that bond them together. Can you think of one your family has? Something that's unique, perhaps, to your family. Maybe it's a special dish at a holiday. A birthday practice. Okay, I'll start. I always have to start this to get you going. This one really is, I don't know where it comes from. But in our family, on your birthday, sometime during the day, another family member will sneak up on you and put butter on your nose. <laughs> don't ask me why, I don't know. But it isn't your birthday if you don't get your nose buttered. Okay. And I can remember the first time my husband was in the family, my mom was... 4'10", my husband's 6'2", and it was quite the vertical jump for my mother. But she managed to butter his nose, and his glasses, and his forehead, and his cheek, and his mouth. And he's like, what is this? And I went, honey, your family, mom buttered your nose. Okay. And for whatever reason, his family has buttered noodles on Easter. You have all this rich food and then a bowl of buttered noodles. <laughs> Don't ask me why. But if there isn't a bowl of buttered noodles there on, e uh, or on Thanksgiving, it isn't Thanksgiving without the buttered noodles. So we have a bowl of buttered noodles. Never gets eaten, but it sits there. <laughs> sort of shines under the light. Can you think of any? Have I triggered anything? Clam chowder on Christmas Eve. Okay, clam chowder on Christmas Eve. Um, we always had a contest when we saw each other first on Christmas morning to be the first to say Merry Christmas. Okay. Or if we talked on the phone, we had to yell, we had to be the first to say Merry Christmas. Okay, who says Merry Christmas first? In case, <laughs> I'm just repeating in case people don't always hear. Well, grandparents are some of the people that keep that going. They have the history of this is what we do in our family. Anybody else thought of one? We have a custom of praying before meals. We all hold hands and say that God is great. Okay, praying before meals, holding hands. And it's gotta be that prayer. And it has to be that specific prayer. Pardon? Ours is Johnny Appleseed. Okay, and yours is Johnny Appleseed. But these things get going, and it's usually grandparents who see to it, it passes down to the next group, and to the next group. They found that grandparents have a direct influence when they also act as caretakers, playmates, and or mentors. How many of you learned a skill from a grandparent? I learned how to drive a nail. Didn't know how. Grandma was fixing something, I was watching, and she goes, here, you do the next one. I'm like, I don't know how, Grandma. 
So she got out a board and I pounded nails for maybe a half an hour until I felt confident enough to finish it. Grandpa taught me how to clean a fish. Okay. Grandma Snavely taught me how to embroider. It was very painful. She was very particular. For every three stitches, I took two out. But I do it very well. It was just painful. Okay. Grandparents have indirect influences because they can provide psychological support for grandchildren. They can provide material support, sometimes to parents, as well as psychological support to parents. And that may allow parents to have more resources on their own. Um, while I'm not a grandparent, I have certainly helped a fair number of college students who have found themselves with ch unplanned children and who are not quite sure what to do when a baby is sick. And they're trying to ask other equally unknowledge, knowledgeable college students what to do. And since I've raised a child, go in and go, what's, what's wrong? Well, there are these red bumps on the bottom. And I don't know what to do about it. Could it be diaper rash? I don't know what's that. <laughs> Red bumps on the bottom. <laughs> Here's some suggestions. You mean other babies get them? Virtually all babies get them at some point. <laughs> okay? Here's what you do. Okay? Just knowing that it's not just their baby is a sense of relief. Denifum and Kowalski found grandparents can reduce stress of single parents by helping with finances, helping with childcare, engaging activities for children. If you're a single parent and you got one going to soccer practice and one going for violin lessons and they're at the same time, we have not yet figured out how to get to two places at once. Sometimes grandparents can help. Grandparents, they found, are also often the source of enriching cognitive stimulation. And remember, we had take you places, because grandparents are often the sources of trips, such as museum and theater performances. And remember, I said aunts and uncles could play this role. When you think about those of you that come to the college for our lecture series, our music or our plays. Think about how many people bring small children with them. But they don't just bring them, they also talk to them afterwards. What did you think about it? What, what picture did you like best? Parents often don't remember to do the second part. What did you get out of it? It's like, well, we can check the museum off. Well, I got them a little culture this weekend. We're done with that. Strong and Devault found that a lot of the influence grandparents have has to do with their attitudes about grandparenting. And they found that it has to have even more to do with their attitudes about parenthood. Those who really didn't like parenthood are not likely to be terribly excited to be grandparents. And that's sort of a logical conclusion, but it's not one we often point out. Not everybody who is a grandparent is thrilled over it or wants to engage it. Nor are they likely to seek opportunities to interact with their grandchildren. And individuals who truly enjoyed parenthood and who enjoy children will maximize the opportunity to spend time with children again and will end up being major influences. So what are some of the issues modern grandparents face? There are really kind of four distinct issues for today's grandparent or great-grandparent. One of those is there are about six million children today 
that are being raised by grandparents, by aunts, by uncles, because their parents either can't or won't take the responsibility. This is kind of interesting. We had a senior do a study looking at grandparents who are raising children and parents raising children to see if there were differences in terms of child behavior issues, school performance, and parental views on raising children. Bear in mind, some were parents, some were grandparents. And what he found was there was not really a lot of difference in terms of behavior issues or school performance. But what he did find was that even though grandparents had already raised children, they questioned whether they were qualified to raise preschool and school age children, because they were looking at elementary age at that time, because they lacked the energy to race after a three-year-old. And parenting had changed so much from when they had children three to nine. And they questioned if they were so great at it, why weren't their kids doing it? And so where he found was differences among those parenting. And he found for those who were parenting grandchildren who were in their 50s and 60s, there was a good deal of resentment. They'd raised their kids. They were beginning to look at being free and clear. And now they were back in parenthood. Not that they resented their grandchildren. They loved their grandchildren, but they thought they'd done their stint. And now they were doing it again. Those are some of the things that Strong and DeVault found. Another issue is that grandchildren are more likely to live at a distance. I never lived further than 30 miles from my grandparents. I saw them every weekend. In the summer, I was at their house, my grandparents, grandparent workman's house every summer. My other grandmother lived with us. My son never lived closer than five hours. He had a good relationship, but I know he missed out. Divorce is more common, and that can affect the grandparent-grandchild relationship. If the divorce is not amicable, grandchildren can get left in the dust. That's harmful for children because grandparents can serve as that stabilizing influence when two adults are having an acrimonious divorce and are not really acting like adults. Grandparents can step in there and be that influence, that warm, supportive influence. But if this is very difficult in the divorce, they may be prohibited and children are left without anyone. Remarriages happen. And this is where grandparents need to remember they're adults and there are new children in the family. I often suggest people think about what was the first time as a new spouse. You went to your first holiday dinner on the other side or the first family picnic and you were the new person and you didn't know anybody. Who remembers that feeling? Huh? How'd you feel? Uncomfortable. Uncomfortable? Somebody else? Cautious. Cautious? If you could have, would you rather have been somewhere else? <laughs> well, now imagine you're this high and you don't know anybody, and you, you were never asked if you wanted to get remarried, you got remarried. Okay. Grandparents are people who can take the first step forward to make a child feel welcome. Or they can be the person who says, I want a picture of all the grandkids. You're not one of them. You're a step over here. You're not going to be in the picture. Sounds cruel, doesn't it? and it happens all the time. So this is where grandparents can be the leaders. You can welcome or you can isolate.
How many of you hear often from your grandkids or great grandkids? How many of you wish you heard more? Would you like some suggestions? No. <laughs> You're gonna get them anyway, because I got one more slide. Ways to connect. We all know about the telephone. Don't be surprised if it goes to voicemail, because today's young people don't use the phone very much to call. Okay, it's a receiver of documents, not an implement to use. Okay? So if you're not into electronic communication, get into it. If you send them a text, you will get a response. The average parent and child text six times a day. A day. I don't because I told my son I wasn't that interested in his life. I don't need a text that says, I'm up now, I'm dressed, I ate breakfast. When he started doing that, I said, you've been doing this since you were five. I don't need to know anymore that you can still do it. Okay? Text me the important things. I don't need to know you brushed your teeth. I don't need to know you got to work. You can do these things. These are basic life skills. He and his dad communicate 12 times a day. Stuff like, hey, never going to guess what? I got to work. Good. More later. Going home from work. Good. Text me when you get there. I don't need that. Okay? But some people do. You're more apt to hear them if you text. How you doing? Grandma and Grandpa just texted me. Cool. I had to text back. I find it funny, my older sister cannot manage text. Every time she tries to text, she ties up her phone so bad the phone company gives her a new one. I don't think it's that hard, but she does. If you're tech savvy, learn to use icons. That will really impress them. Okay? Join Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Ask to be a part of theirs. Now this is a sneaky one. Use snail mail. You know where you put a stamp on it, it goes to their address? Because today's young people are not used to getting snail mail that isn't either an advertisement or at the college, something from the college. So when they see actual handwriting from you with a stamp on it, they almost cry at the mailbox. They got real mail. And if it's attached to a package, they don't even get outside the building before they're opening it unless they think it has food. If they think it could be food, they wait till they get to the room because they don't want to share. Okay? Getting mail is an exciting novelty to them. Don't expect they'll write you back unless you have to develop a fill-in-the-blank letter. How are you today with some possible choices? How busy are you with some possible choices? Address the envelope, put the stamp on it, get one of those self-peeling so that they just have to check boxes and put it in. They might do that, okay? Now, this was something I learned from my dad. If you can't be with the grandchild you love, love the one you can be with. That is, Find out if the local school needs volunteers for things like reading programs, math tutors, whatever, and volunteer. There are lots of children out there who don't have active grandparents, who don't have a stabilizing influence. You could be that. My dad, after my niece was grown and gone, said, you know, I still have a lot I can teach a child. I have a lot of skills and I love kids. In an appropriate way, you know, we had the, a proper physical touching in a proper way. So he called the school and they said, well, you know, we've got this one little boy who nobody can reach. He's not reading. He's kind of disruptive. 
Do you want to come have lunch with him? My dad started going up to the elementary school and having lunch with the kid. And then they started reading. My dad started, took a book up one day and said, well, I have a little extra time, I'm just going to read. Real men don't read. I was in the Navy, I was in war, I supervised men, I read. I am a man, therefore men read. What are you reading about? It's a Western. It's about cowboys and Indians. It's a Louis L'Amour Western. Hmm. I don't think I could read that. Well, not now, you're not old enough. But I bet we could find a book you could read. Let's go ask the lunchroom person if we can go over to the library. They went to the library and they found a book. Dad picked out a book for him with the librarian's help. And when my dad left, the little boy said, are you coming back tomorrow? Nobody ever comes back the next day. Dad said, what time's lunch? It's always at this time. I'll see you tomorrow. In other words, he didn't have small grandchildren around anymore, but he found a small child that needed him. You don't have to wait for your own to show up to find a child that needs you. Who has other ideas? Find a skill you can teach. I like to teach my granddaughter sewing. We made several things. We have a sewing machine for her that lives in my house because she's only 10 years old. Okay. When she used to be 12. She'll get the machine in her house. Okay, teach a child to sew. I know. There was a group la uh, last summer that was, had got some donated machines and were teaching basic sewing skills and basic canning skills, same thing. Those are arts that a lot of, a lot of adults, let alone children, don't know. Or gardening. Good, good examples. Can anybody think of anything else? Other ways maybe you are in touch with your grandchildren or great-grandchildren or nieces or nephews or great-nieces and nephews. One of the things I didn't know that my father was doing once he realized that his time on earth was short because of a, a very aggressive cancer was he started writing, if you will, kind of a, a life history book and then had it bound for my niece and my son. And I had no idea he did it. It is not something that would have been innate to his character to do, but it was such a wonderful gift in which he talked about all of his aunts and uncles and various journeys, his time at war, stories I had never heard, pictures of his ship that I had never seen, things I never knew. And I thought that was such a delightful parting gift that they received after he had passed. Which I thought was a, a beautiful last gift very surprising gift. Okay. What we focused on has been the impact of grandparents because that's where the literature has taken us. But I think aunts, uncles, and other members of family can fulfill the same role. I don't think it's simply because of a label that you have. I think other people can be the family historian, share important stories and customs, and can offer that kind of unconditional love that we have. I think what is important is that children have an adult that they can turn to who will always be there, who will dry tears and tell them tomorrow will be better. It's also important to remember that no matter how old you are, there's a child in all of us. 
And so, as long as we have these people in our mind, we will always have that sense of love and unconditional love and warmth. And I want to thank you for allowing me to come and take your time once again. All you have to do is tell Advancement you don't want me anymore and I won't drive up here anymore. So thank you for your time and your attention today. <laughs>